Let me tell you a little academic secret here. Many successful academic careers, including some who have gone on to become chairs at prestigious universities, were built on the foundation of producing educational exhibits at scale. I'm Puneet, professor of radiology, and I've done over 150 of these and have it down to a process. If you follow this process, you can do these at a very high level, set yourself up for big awards, and get invited to publishing your work in prestigious journals. Educational exhibits in all medical specialties are similar. In radiology, these are designed to review radiologic signs, pathologic correlation, procedure techniques, treatments or interventions related to the practice of imaging. These exhibits can be pretty much anything under the sun as long as they have educational value. If the focus of your abstract is research, your abstract should be submitted as a scientific presentation. I will link to my video and getting your research papers published here. When I was early on in my career, I was struggling to find mentors and really didn't have the skills to write anything meaningful. All I could do was collect my interesting cases, organize them into abstracts, and submit them to national society meetings as educational exhibits. Some of these won awards and we managed to publish most of them as review articles, giving my career the momentum it needed to become a young professor at the University of Washington. Not just that, because we were writing several review articles a year, I got the opportunity to become the editor of a radiology journal, got grand rounds and visiting professorship invitations, and visited some of my favorite countries like Brazil, Egypt, Mexico, and Saudi Arabia. All of this became possible because of the large number of educational exhibits on on a variety of topics I had at my disposal, ready to be turned into lectures at short notice. You can do the same if you're driven and share similar aspirations. This much requested video is designed for medical students, research trainees, residents, and junior faculty to teach them the ropes of how to create an award-winning educational exhibits. But really, I want you to build momentum in your academic career early and have fun while working hard. Let's begin. Creating an educational exhibit is a three-part process. Finding ideas, writing the abstract, finally creating the educational exhibits themselves. There's a fair bit to unpack here. Timestamps are in the description below. If you would like to skip around to a different section, feel free. Consider giving this video a like so the YouTube algorithm can show it to others like yourself who may benefit from this video. Start by making a list of your interesting cases. This list does not have to be organized in any manner when it's small. Over time, organize your list by organ systems and then further classify into congenital, infectious, benign, malignant, and other miscellaneous etiologies. Parse them out by emergent situations, medical and surgical complications. Depending on where you work and the kind of cases you have, a theme will start to form. You will get some ideas here. It may take one or two years for this to happen, so be patient. If you are in the reading room and have a hard case and are not finding any relevant literature to help you out, or your go-to article is five years or older, these are great ideas to present as educational exhibits in the future. Five years is the time frame when most journals will reconsider a topic for an update. Often journals also publish lists of topics that they need as review articles, so you can start by making educational exhibits on those topics. Ask your senior colleagues for ideas and their list of great cases. Add them as co-authors for their contributions. You may get lucky if your institution has organized list of interesting cases for learning, and you're truly blessed if your institution has invested in software that can help you run an electronic search with keywords to get you the cases you need. Look for topic ideas in allied subspecialties that you can pursue in your domain. If you have access to a new technology, you have a head start, but don't think you have to restrict your ideas to just clinical topics. We have won awards on finance, wellness, and time management topics in conferences with a very strong clinical focus. Double down on your strengths and do what you can better than anybody else. Now that you have your idea, it needs to be packaged and submitted into a meeting as an abstract. The acceptance rate for well-written and packaged abstracts in major meetings is around 50 to 75%. So plan to submit at least two to three abstracts if you'd like to present at least one. There's an element of luck involved in getting some of these accepted, so plan accordingly. A typical abstract is brief, often limited to certain characters, usually around 1350 to 1500 words for most meetings, and is composed of sections such as teaching points, table of contents, or outline, and increasingly requires submitting five figures, 
that can be images, charts, or graphs. These five images are for review purposes only, and the intent of this is to show the reviewer what they can expect to see in your final product. These five slides are critical to getting your abstract accepted. The first slide should be a slide with a good descriptive title with a list of authors involved and their institutions. The remaining four slides should be a combination of radiology and pathology, and ideally should be a nice sampling of what you intend to cover in your presentation. If you don't submit these, you will likely get rejected, especially in meetings where there are thousands of abstracts submitted every year. On the other hand, if you do these well, you dramatically increase the odds of acceptance. So give yourself at least two weeks before the deadline to start putting these together. Your abstract should demonstrate a well thought out plan and leave the reviewer excited to see your final product. It's a general expectation that most materials you present, including text and media, should be the original work performed at the author's institutions and not borrowed from the scientific literature. Often meetings have options for paper posters and computer exhibits. I prefer the latter because these can be used as lectures and grand rounds, including when you're asked to present at the time of your first job interview. Paper posters can make for good decoration in the hallways of your department, but other than that, serve no future use. Once the deadline to submit abstract passes, these are presented to abstract reviewers who are asked to review anywhere between 20 and 50 abstracts at a time. Reviewers are busy individuals and often often very quickly review these abstracts. It helps to have titles that arouse curiosity and provide entertainment to the reviewers during the boring task of abstract review. I talk in detail about how to write a good title in getting your research papers published video, but let me tell you a real life story here. A few years ago, we submitted an abstract titled CT Imaging of Benign and Malignant Splenic Lesions. This got rejected. The next year, we submitted the same abstract with the title Imaging of the Forgotten Quadrant, Unusual and Uncommon Splenic Lesions with Emphasis on CT. Not only did it get accepted, we also got invited to present a CME talk. You must think from the reviewer's perspective when writing your abstract and have a few things that the reviewer may not have seen frequently in their clinical practice. Enough said about the title. Your teaching points should address two simple questions. Why your topic presents a valuable teaching opportunity and what is your unique approach to the topic? The table of contents or outline should not merely list that you will show anatomy, benign and malignant lesions. That's boring and will put the reviewer to sleep, but rather provide specific details about imaging techniques, list the specific entities you're going to show. Do you have laparoscopic, endoscopic, and pathologic correlation? What kind of surgical techniques and complications are you going to show? Are you also going to show interventional radiology procedures? Prioritize rare and uncommon entities here. No one one wants to waste their precious time seeing common things. Many societies will invite presenters of these educational exhibits to give a short CME podium talk, which is an opportunity for practicing public speaking, especially early in your career. So consider choosing that option that you will be available to present if invited. Now it's finally time to prepare that award-winning educational exhibit and hone down the process. Think long and hard about how you envision your educational exhibit. You would not go and build a house without having a blueprint in place. So why would you make an educational exhibit without thinking how much space you are going to give for each topic in the limited number of slides provided. The current slide limit for popular meetings is usually around 35 slides, but this changes a bit every year. So make sure to check what are the latest instructions for the meeting you are targeting. If you only have 35 slides, the first slide is the title slide. The second slide is the objective slide. The second last slide is typically the conclusion slide, and the last slide should ideally be your references. Now that four slides are gone, the remaining 31 slides can be divided to cover the breadth of the material that you plan to present. The reason it is important to think this way is that you don't waste too many slides for a certain topic, only to find that you need to delete these slides because you don't have enough space to cover other things that you wanna show. This planning saves valuable time and leads to better organized content. Data suggests that most attendees spend between two to 10 minutes viewing an electronic presentation, so plan accordingly. Early in this process, identify any tables or figures that you would need permissions to reuse, although this should be avoided as much as possible by creating your own with attribution. 
Use Adobe Illustrator or similar software to propose a management algorithm for your topic if appropriate. Your PowerPoint slide will be uploaded into an online digital presentation system, which converts these slides into multiple video formats so that the viewer can view your presentation on computers and mobile devices. If you use video files, make sure that these are compatible with the presentation system or preferably use GIF images. Often there is a click limit. For example, our largest national meeting currently has a 75 click limit, including for slide transitions. I don't personally like too many clicks as a lot of radiologists have wrist pain from incessant scrolling and have never gotten closer to this limit personally. Be resourceful to find funds so that you can hire a medical illustrator to add that extra oomph to your educational exhibit. 95% of submissions lack these, so having a few illustrations can easily put you in the top 5%. Medical illustrations typically cost around $150 to $200 for a single black and white image and around $350 to $500 for colored illustrations. Pricey, I know, but having artistic medical illustrations really does set you up for winning awards and getting invited for publications in prestigious journals. The cover slide is critically important. Think of it as a cover page of a book. Use it to showcase the breadth of pathology, modalities and procedures you show in your PowerPoint to entice the viewer to choose your exhibit for viewing. Use a light shade of blue throughout the slides, including your title slide, as this color is easy on the eyes and do not forget to list an email address so that anyone wanting to send you kudos or invitation to write an article or an oral presentation can easily reach you. Now let's talk about the wow slides. There should be two to three slides, preferably early in your exhibit, that should elicit the wow emotional response from the viewer. This extra effort in using good slide design techniques, such as those from Presentation Zen, video linked above, can make the critical difference between your exhibit and those of your peers when it comes to awards and manuscript solicitations. Consider showing a few cases or techniques that your viewers may not have known about. For example, the ALP surgical technique as shown in the slide. Use smart arts as much as possible for visual impact. Slides designed for an educational exhibit should be a little bit wordy than what you should use in an oral presentation, but not overtly descriptive to avoid cognitive overload. I use bullet points and incomplete sentences, but write complete legends without abbreviations so that these can be reproduced for eventual publication without much change. An educational exhibit is not the end of a project, rather a means to an end the final product being the review article on the topic. You have already spent months preparing your educational exhibit and likely know more about that topic than anybody else at this point. So why not spend a few more days and write the article? You have the images selected, have the content organized, legends and references are done. So at this point, it's just kind of writing a medical essay. Commonly, educational exhibit award committees are different than solicitation committees for the society's journal. So don't despair if your award-winning exhibit does not get an article solicitation or vice versa. If you follow the advice and process discussed in this video so far, your educational exhibit will likely be of the standard to receive some of the highest awards like the magna cum laude or the cum laude awards. Often there are numerous certificate of merit awards being given out to encourage presenters to attend the meeting and you should be getting a few of these easily. I leave you with this video of a webinar recording I did for radiology residents on how to succeed in radiology and in your life, stuff distilled from my 15 years in academic radiology. Consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.